An American Toyota? A Swedish WRX? A Mitsubishi from the States? What the hell is going on? Badge engineering, the process where a company sells a vehicle made by another company as their own, often changing the name, badges, and sometimes the mechanical components. Badge engineering is usually seen as a sly attempt to make a few extra bucks or save a suffering brand, and that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. One of the first cases of badge engineering was surprisingly early in the history of the automobile. This guy named Charles Nash had a car company called Nash. It was really successful, but he wanted more. So he started another company called Ajax, named for the fearless warrior in Greek mythology. I mean, he was Zeus's great grandson. Not a bad guy to name your car after. Anyway, the Ajax was basically a Nash, but people didn't like it and it didn't sell. The company started an advertising campaign saying that Ajaxes were literally Nash cars, but that didn't help either. So Mr. Nash decided to shut down the Ajax factory for two days and spend that time rebadging all the remaining Ajax cars with Nash hood ornaments and hubcaps. Nash even gave away conversion kits for the Ajax so owners wouldn't have to live with the shame of owning a car that went under. So the first rebadge wasn't successful, but the practice of badge engineering continues to this day. But why? Well, a couple of reasons. The first is cost. It can cost billions to develop new models, so companies like GM will take a car from one brand, put new emblems on it, and maybe switch up the styling a little bit, and sell it under another name. I mentioned GM specifically because they really like doing this, to varying degrees of success. As we learned in the Saturn episode, the Saturn View was a rebadged Chevy Equinox, which was a rebadged Opel Antara. Most of the development behind the Antara platform was done in Korea by GM's Daewoo division, which produced their own Windstorm SUV, the coolest SUV name ever. Windstorm Extreme. And that was so f so in GM's case, they were able to design something that made sense in markets all over the world, and that's great from a business perspective. GM only had to develop one platform to make four cars. It succeeded because small SUVs work pretty much everywhere. What doesn't work is adapting one car for a market where it won't. Back in 2004, the Pontiac brand was losing a little bit of luster. They were no longer known for the sporty nature under which they were founded. They needed a fast car. Lucky for them, GM had a fast car in Australia. Holden had been a subsidiary of GM since 1931, and one of the most famous models, the Monaro, was one of the few cars that the company made that wasn't a badge job. The Monaro had been in production since 1968 and amassed a cult following all over the land of Oz. It has a comparable fan base to the Camaro or Mustang over here. It's a legend. Naturally, people would love it over here, right? Wrong, because we don't know what the heck a Holden is. The only Australian things we knew in 2004 were Kylie Minogue and Steve Irwin. They killed both of us. Son of a gun. Anyway, Pontiac needed a fast car, and GM thought the Monaro would be the perfect fit. But what should they call it? The Monaro name didn't mean anything in the States, and coming up with something new might hurt the chances of selling it. So they dug up a nostalgia-filled name that hadn't been seen since the 70s, arguably the most important three letters in all of Pontiac history, G-T-O. And people liked it. Pontiac sold over 40,000 rebadged Monaros in a short three-year run, but it wasn't enough to save the Pontiac brand from folding. The main critique was that the new GTO wasn't a true GTO. Sure, it was cool, it had a V8, it had a Pontiac badge, but it wasn't a Pontiac. There was nothing about it that said GTO, except the badge they glued on the bumper. Another reason manufacturers turn to rebadges is competition at home. One company might have a gap in their lineup that their competitor is filling. Obviously, you can't let that happen. But as we learned earlier, it's expensive to develop a whole new car. I'm not trying to make this about GM, but they found themselves in this pickle back in the 80s. General Motors wasn't known for making economical cars, but now they needed one because consumers were rushing to buy gas-friendly commuters like the Toyota Corolla. So they went to Toyota and asked, hey man, can I borrow your Corolla? It's really good and we want to sell it too. Lucky for GM, Toyota wanted to start building cars in the States, so they came to an agreement. GM and Toyota would share a factory in California and GM would get to sell the Corolla Sprinter. GM couldn't call it the Corolla, obviously, so starting in 1985, GM's Corolla would be sold as the Nova. Then in 1988, it would be called the Geo Prism. For 16 years, there was essentially a Chevy Corolla. Toyota and GM's partnership lasted through April 2010, when their joint factory had to close. The Fremont, California facility was bought a month later by an electric car startup called Tesla. 
who used the factory so they could stop making the Roadster, which coincidentally was just a rebadged Lotus Elise. Time is a flat circle. So far, the badge jobs we've looked at were either okay or mildly successful. But what about the ones that weren't. In 1986, BMW unveiled the M3, a coupe that has pretty much been the gold standard for sports cars ever since. Cadillac saw it was like, we need something like that. A stylish, dynamic, rear-wheel drive, two-door world beater. What they put out was just a beater. The Cadillac Cimarron was based off the Chevy Cavalier, which itself was developed in response to the oil crisis of the 70s. Both the Cavalier and the Cimarron shared the GM J platform, which was front-wheel drive and powered by an anemic, transverse-mounted four-cylinder. To make matters worse, the rear suspension used a pathetic torsion beam design. Any hopes for the Cimarron to compete with the M3 were dead before it even left the factory floor. The Cimarron was such a colossal failure that it almost killed the Cadillac brand. Auto journalist Dan Neal called it everything that was wrong, banal, lazy, and mendacious about GM in the 1980s. I had to look up what mendacious means. When auto riders bust out the thesaurus, that's when you know they're serious. The most egregious case of badge engineering, in my opinion, comes from Aston Martin in 2011. When I think of Aston's, I imagine unrivaled grace, posture, and Sean Connery. Aston Martin is like the ultimate British car brand. They're also not great on gas. This was a problem when the European Union handed down regulations that said every manufacturer had to improve the emissions of their entire fleet. Aston Martin didn't want to compromise the performance of their current lineup or turn to hybrid technology. So the easiest way to improve their average was to use someone else's car. Enter the Toyota IQ. Capable of 66 miles per gallon, it was the perfect candidate to boost Aston's fuel economy. There was a problem. The IQ doesn't look anything like an Aston Martin. So Aston grafted their signature face onto the IQ, gave it a premium interior, and boosted the power by 42% to a whopping 98 horsepower. Oh, and it cost nearly $40,000. Aston Martin CEO Ulrich Bez claimed that Signet represented the company's commitment to innovation and integrity and satisfied Europe's demands for emissions and space. Well, I claim bullshit. Come on, you're Aston Martin. You couldn't think of anything better than a Toyota? Aston planned on selling 4,000 Signets a year to offset their average emissions. Looking back on it, that was pretty optimistic. In its two-year lifespan, Aston Martin sold only 150 of their rebadged Toyotas in the UK. That's crazy. I can sell more artisan candles at the flea market in one weekend. You know, the hardest part is getting the scent just right. People are so picky. The saddest badge engineering story comes from, you guessed it, General Motors. The Chevy SS was by all accounts the perfect car. Manual transmission, 415 horsepower, and rear-wheel drive. <laughs> It was the coolest Chevy in a long, long time. It was also from Australia. It was another Holden, the Commodore, and nobody bought it. In its four-year run, just under 13,000 of them were sold. The SS failed for the same reason the GTO, Signet, and even Saturn did. The brand identity just wasn't there. The SS was sick, but only to enthusiasts like us online. Nobody else cared. It didn't fit in. It might have been a Chevy, but it was made for Australians, not Americans. And Americans? didn't want to hold it. We look at the lesser known stories of the car world every week on Wheelhouse, so subscribe to Donut Media so you never miss an episode. I know I missed a ton of rebadged cars. There's a lot of them. So let's talk about them in the comments. There are some good ones, but I want to hear about it. Buy a damn shirt. It feeds James. Follow me on IG at Nolan J Sykes and follow Donut at Donut Media for more cool stuff. Wear your seatbelt. I'll see you next time.